Good afternoon and welcome to the final Define Art panel for 2021. I am Devin Vandervoort and it is my pleasure to welcome Rose B. Simpson to our conversation today. I'm a current student at SCAD studying art history with a minor in museum studies. I'm originally from Syracuse, New York and much like Rose, I'm committed to creating a better world through my talents and unique perspective. Rose is a mixed media artist from Santa Clara, Pueblo, New Mexico. From ceramic sculptures to fashion, medals to music, and poetry to custom cars, Rose has created powerful pieces that play across emotional, social, and cultural realms. In her own words, Rose is a healer. Her art, a cure for objectification, stereotyping, and disempowerment. Her practice is informed by the Pueblo's historic production of clay pottery and its distinct methods of firing and formation. In Countdown, a major new commission presented in the SCAD MOA jewel boxes, Simpson combines her inherited tribal belief systems with high art concepts and apocalyptic science fiction forms. Her pieces are showcased across North America and exhibited internationally. She is a mother, a teacher, and a powerful voice for women in the oppressed. Moderating today's panel is DJ Hellerman, one of the curators at the SCAD Museum of Art. Together, they're going to discuss Rose's journey her point of view, and where she is going next. With that, I want to welcome Rose and DJ. Thank you, Devin. And thanks, Rose. Hi. Thanks for being here with us today. I know you're super busy. We're really excited to have this conversation. Um, before we begin, I, I want to thank my colleague, Ariella Wollens, um, for initiating this really incredible project that we get to talk about today. Um, and then also um, yesterday, um, Devin and myself and a couple of SCAD students had were able to meet at the Jewel Boxes um, to look at Countdown, Rose's installation. Um, so I wanted to thank um, Isabella Brennan from Art History, Ivan Delgado from Graphic Design, and Christian Arnsberger from Motion Media Design for having a conversation with me because their thoughts were really important um, and ha really helped kind of where I'm gonna where we're talking um, today. So Rose, um, so can you explain where in the world you're speaking to us from? I am here in my studio um, in um, about a half a mile from the Rio Grande River in Northern New Mexico on my ancestral homelands. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. Our main um, tribal center, our Pueblo is, is right across the river. So I could, if you yelled from the middle of the Pueblo, I could hear it from my studio. Um, so that's where I'm talking to you from. It's an Adobe building. And so um, it has been a challenge to meet with everyone via internet. Um, so this is a big deal and a special moment. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for trying to figure out the, the Wi-Fi conundrum in your, in, your special, in your special place. I know that could <laughs> maybe be an intrusion to a very, a very special uh, atmosphere you have. There are pros and cons for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Um, as we get started, you know, thinking about where you are and speaking to us from, I'm wondering if you could just kind of really generally and broadly talk to us about place and, and, and how place is so important to your practice. Um, place has totally defined who I am. And I feel like um, I, I, I guess I can't relate to um, the feeling of placelessness, um, but that's because I have the privilege of growing up on my ancestral homelands and, you know, um, spending time with my great grandmother in the house that her great, great, great grandmother built, you know, um, and, you know, there's a kind of ancestral rootedness to this place. Um, and I've definitely wanted anonymity and I've wanted freedom from it. And part of that was actually going to graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design, wanting so badly to, to have, um, you know, the space to create my own identity. And what I did find was that as much as um, I am a weirdo <laughs> where I come from, I'm also very much a part of this place and it has made me who I am. Um, and I think part of it is the absolute rawness of this place and the ability to see the earth and interact with things directly. Um, it feeds this um, sort of attitude or energy of transparency and um, integrity in a sense, like this direct honesty and rawness that I, that I find vital in the work that I'm trying to do. 
as you were, you know, moving into, you know, uh, maybe a more established way of making work, like I've been thinking a lot about, you know, when I was a student and trying to find like what my own identity was and trying to establish that. And then as an artist, you're not only establishing identity, but you're trying to under, trying to establish a language visually. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that narrative because um, you, you come you know, from a lineage of, of makers. Um, and I think it might be particularly, um, particularly challenging if you're not going to totally reject that lineage you know, your family history, if you want to be a part of it, to find your space and to find your place. Um, what was that like for you? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to fly fighter jets. <laughs> I wanted to go to the Air Force and fly fighter jets. And, um, you know, uh, my mom hung up on the Air Force and asked me if I wanted to kill people. And I was like, no, I just want to fly fighter jets. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I took ceramics at the University of New Mexico as an easy credit because it was something I grew up with very closely. Um, it was my mom's livelihood and, and the, what fed our entire family. And also, you know, a bunch of family members support themselves off of their ceramics. And that, had, that has been, you know, culturally what we've done. Um, my mom is, uh, took, that legacy of ceramics and made it especially hers through using um, commercial clays and kiln firing and also um, taking um, the skills and the processes and making them hers by um, doing sort of contemporary uh, figurative work rather than the traditional pottery styles. Um, and so I really, I realized, I didn't realize until I was in graduate school, the privilege of having a family that has supported themselves with their artwork. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a neural pathway I didn't need to build. And, um, and I realized, you know, it took me a while to find my privilege there. Um, but it also is challenging to um, take a conversation and show respect for it and honor that conversation, but also, like you said, create a new language with it. Um, and I really feel like my background um, and my childhood where my mother raised us in permaculture, this, this study of sustainable living systems, um, and also, you know, spirituality and philosophy and clay and growing our own food and building our homes out of mud. Um, it all fed this kind of search for our common humanity and how we can use resources to, you know, um, sort of trigger or conjure growth and give material for, for the active growth of, of ourselves and humanity as a whole. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like my mom, uh, Roxanne Swenzel, has worked really hard to build that kind of language for herself. And she went leaps and bounds beyond the traditions and the sort of stereotypical ideas of what that looks like. And she, you know, created this incredible foundation where I could take it even further. Um, and so my work has been a really tender and sensitive balance between. Um, perpetuating stereotypes of indigenous peoples, but also, you know, uh, trying to reach out and include, you know, humanity as a whole by trying to address sort of our, our common humanity. Um, and also through, through sort of the lens of like a queer person of color, right? And, and how that, and how that perspective um, allows me to sort of deconstruct those internalized thinking patterns and stereotypes and neural passages that, that I've, you know, that have become part of my identity. And all my work is about um, growing myself and through the growth of myself, I hope that I can help others through that reflection find um, pathways to themselves as well. So if clay is one one way, you know, where you help grow yourself, metal is another. Yeah. <laughs> um, the difference between I keep choosing clay because 
um, clay is very, um, is water-based, right? So it's full of molecular water. And I feel like water um, is one of the most um, reactive elements, like instantly reactive elements. So it, um, it picks up on our energy, right? So whatever your intentions are, it actually listens and responds to those intentions. Um, and so I keep returning to clay because, well, we have an ancestral uh, familial relationship, but also uh, clay keeps me honest, right? And it also really has the capacity to rip open my chest cavity and reveal what's inside. And I feel like that's vital in my process. And I found a balance though with metal um, and, and as uh, emotional and intuitive as the ceramic, the clay, my relationship to the clay is for me, the metal offers a, a, a nice balance. It, it, require, it creates the structure for that emotional space. Um, and so I return to metal for the sort of, sort of ease of the emotional reflection. Um, and I think there, there needs to be a nice relationship, um, which is why I actually um, got into cars, um, is that is definitely a metal relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the Midwest, so I, I really um, identify with your love of vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> it is, that's were, another place-based thing. I, I yeah. think it is. Yeah. yeah, freedom. They were all freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about Countdown. Um, so I'm going to pull up some images, I'll share my screen. Um, OK, so here we are, um, you know, at the at the out at, at your approach to the, the SCAD Museum of Art um, with our, our jewel boxes. Um, and I'm wondering if you just, you know, talk a little bit about how the conversation started uh, for, for this commission. The first time I went on Google Maps and wandered around the streets and looked at these things, um, you know, the, the metaphor that they, they provide is spectacular. It really is. Um, the fact that it's glass that you get to interact with, and I saw the glass as a material, right? It's a material to work with. It wasn't um, a spacer between human and art. It was actually a vital point of, of, of interaction. Um, and then the, 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 the shape of the brick cut out in the side of the building um, is a threshold. Um, and there, and it's, it, there's so much metaphor and meaning in it. It's in relationship to outside, to our natural world. Um, the art has to engage with sunlight, with passersby, with birds, with the trees, all of the things, is, it becomes a part of it. And that was so exciting to me. Um, and so I actually um, built the idea around um, the glass itself. Um, and one of my first questions was, can I lean on the glass? <laughs> you know, like, can I interact with that glass? How strong is it, you know? Um, and so that was super exciting um, to think of that glass as, as one of the most, it's a, it's a transparent, um, inaccessible threshold that's like made it through this door, but can't get past this moment, but it's also like existing externally, but also internally. It's really mm -hmm. amazing. You know, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the the actual figures too. When we were talking yesterday, when we were standing outside, there was a conversation about how even though these figures um, are in their own spaces, um, feel very connected. I think um, the fact that there's four was also, you know, if if I if there were only one window. You know, what you could do with it, uh, it changes when you are all of a sudden have the opportunity to fill four of these. Um, and four is an important number for me. It's the directions um, and, it, you know, um, it feels um, incredibly holistic. It's a holistic mm -hmm. number. So it seems to cover all your boundaries when you, when, when you think about it in directions. Um, 
And so thinking about it, it was like, it's also a feat, a physical feat, you know, when you go, I, my body, my physical space has to somehow fill these with intention and make it, you know, feel full and make it feel, um, you know, met and worthy and influential in the way that I want it to be. Um, and that was, that was challenging as well. When I got the go ahead to actually lean these pieces against the glass, you know, I could run with that. And I was super excited. Also, when I got the thumbs up to tint the glass, that was another thing that that being able to do a two dimensional um, effect on the glass itself, you know, changed how that space felt and put the piece in a lot more context and very intentional context. And the idea of the the backsplash of the piece on the back um, existing as kind of a shadow. I was like an intentional shadow because of the layers of the space. It provided these opportunities to play with, you know, potential light and darkness and how, you know, alignment happens with sunlight, et cetera, or the idea of it. Um, when I realized they think these windows are north facing, <laughs> I was kind of bummed out because I was really wanting the sun to go through and, and light up the back wall. But then I felt like um, conceptually, it turns that alignment into our own um, responsibility, right? It's mm -hmm. our own conceptual responsibility to, to do that alignment. We can't wait for nature to fix things and figure it out for us in a sense. Um, the work is about that alignment. You know, there was a lot of talk um, about the title um, you know, countdown and, you know, we were kind of volleying ideas back and forth from, you know, um, amongst ourselves about, you know, what that might mean, uh, a, a countdown to what, um, you know, to the end of something or to the, the start of something um, was kind of how, um, how it was, be, you know, being discussed yesterday? Um, initially, that intention was a little bit uh, one linery. Um, and I wanted to put actual dates on the windows themselves mm. um, of, of uh, influential moments in, in the history of uh, Indigenous people in the country. Um, so 1492, um, 1680, um, 1492 being a common date, but 1680 being when the Pueblo, the Pueblo revolt that drove the Spanish out of New Mexico was one of the biggest uh, mm. indigenous revolutions that ever happened. And so I was gonna use those numbers and leave them, you know, uh, subtle. And people have to do their research around what that number was. And I wanted, I, I started thinking about the heavy handedness of it and how that countdown turned into um, a feeling that I didn't want to be a part of. I wanted to, I'm, you know, I believe in change. I, re, I believe in our power to make really lasting social change. But as I was making this work, I didn't want to invest. Um, this yucky, angry feeling into it that I was feeling that made me, made it turn into us versus them and them being this like generalized who's them. And I didn't like how it made me feel. And because of the amount of work that I had to do to create these, this, these pieces, I realized that me being in that state wasn't going to actually allow these pieces to come into being mm -hmm. um, because the, the water is listening to my internal molecular water and the kind of place I'm in. And so it's going to respond and I guarantee these pieces are gonna break, <laughs> explode mm. in the kiln because if I have, in my, if I'm holding that tension, so are they. Mm. And the tension is already in the work itself. The fact that they're balancing, the fact that the, the, these really heavy clay works are balancing and that they're, they're leaning against glass is tension enough. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's, and, a, it's incredible tension. And I know um, it's a, 
it's something that you think about a lot, like, how, and, and like a, maybe artists think about this a lot. How much do you need to say? You know, how right. how didactic, um, how how much information needs to be put forward, and how much needs to be withheld, um, mm -hmm. and and for what end? I think it's a really beautiful, mm -hmm. um, you know, way that you're talking about that situation in creating these. And I think um, part of it is that. I believe that the healing of humanity and the reason that any of this was necessary or any of these atrocities even happened was because we don't have the ability to look at ourselves. Mm. And if I want any change to happen externally, I need to look at my own desire to be a victim, my own potential for victimry. And, um, as long as I stay, or I have found within myself that as long as I stay in um, an inherited mode of victimry, I will manifest uh, experiences of being victimized. Um, and I need to change that within myself so I can stop this on behalf of the earth herself. Um, because when she says no, no more, it will be no more. And if I say no more, it will be no more. But I have to work up to that moment. And I can't tell anyone else, you know, to change until I really truly do that work within myself. And so I've noticed in my life that, you know, I find that that social... Uh, awareness work is in, is vital it's vital and I'm really happy and grateful for people who are brave enough to feel that they can put themselves out there in those ways um, I feel like I cannot do that without getting hurt I cannot put myself out there without exploding without cracking without breaking without smashing until I really believe that through my core and so the best thing I can do is, is approach the feelings of tension that exist within myself um, with care and with, um, with patience and with tenderness. Um, and that requires no finger pointing even at myself because that didactic approach doesn't help me love myself. And if I'm trying to change things and make active change in the world, you know, um, I feel like there's a lot of, of real introspection that needs to happen that's really brave and vulnerable. And if we don't have um, patience and compassion for ourselves, we will self-destruct, just like the clay. <laughs> yeah, and it, re it requires, a, I think, a really profound... Um, sense of connectedness a really deep um a deep understanding of a oneness of the way in which we're connected with the world and with each other um, right. because when it's a when it's a when it's led with you know individuality or divisiveness or disconnection that enables those kinds of activities to happen i agree and what's beautiful was, you know, one of the most beautiful things about this process was when I got, you know, I couldn't come. So I was, um, you know, uh, communicating via text around the installation of this work, which is heartbreaking to me. But there was something magical when I got a photo of the front of the glass and there was a reflection of outside onto the glass on the face and I realized that when someone walks by they might see themselves in that glass mm. and that, that was a whole layer I didn't even consider mm. um and I and I was absolutely caught by that um new layer of reflection that was actually incredibly direct these are a couple of images of how the work was shipped. So basically, you know, you you made the work and then created it, and it came to Savannah. Um, 
So it's a, you know, this is just an installation image for people to see, you know, how like the care that it takes to move these, you know, kind of a, across the country. Um, I'm wondering if you'd talk a little bit about um, the process of making them for you. We, you know, we have a lot of makers and I'm wondering, you know, what that process was like for you. So one of the biggest hurdles was that I had planned to have a studio assistant, an extra set of hands, and I had planned to have an extra set of hands to watch my four-year-old daughter. And because of the COVID precautions that increased in September and October, I lost both of those uh, helps. <laughs> and so I did this uh, by myself while watching my four-year-old. Um, and they were heavy and it was really scary. And there were a lot of moments where I had to like stop and really breathe because I was making these really large ceramic things with no base. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, um, you know, one of the, this is one of the hardest projects I've ever done. And mm -hmm. um, it's physically taxing. And I think when, you know, I like motorcycles, I like rock climbing, and these things make me incredibly present. You know, you have to be very, very, very mindful of what you're doing as you're doing it. Otherwise, you're gonna mess up. And the messing up, you know, can be really bad. Um, and so doing this project, I had to stay, um, careful I had to stay careful mm. um, and it was hard because I'm used to you know working fast and hard and to try and work fast and hard and carefully was an extra you know push so these are do you do you that's envision my car them? shop yeah <laughs> and ceramic studio yeah I, I moved the classics outside so I could have space for my clay <laughs> <laughs> so did you envision these as one installation at some point um i actually look forward to um they have a they're going to go to another exhibit um in massachusetts and they will be um actually leaning forehead to forehead in the space and so because knowing that this work was going to continue on to another exhibit, I actually had to make two pairs, two matching sets, um, and to make them the same height so that they would lean forehead to forehead and not fall. And that was an extra challenge um, because clay shrinks in this, in, as it um, is made. And there's a lot of calculations around shrinkage um, and that I was trying to account for. Um, so I look forward to, you know, that exhibit where they lean forehead to forehead, and that is a really, um, you know, direct commentary on relationship. Um, but I'm excited to see how else they might end up, you know, in mm. relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm wondering if there's any uh, production tips or, or or tricks that you learn making this that you can you know, share with any of the students who are working in clay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know about that. <laughs> I used, um, I think it was like 700 pounds of clay. Um, and, um, mm. you know, one of the main things I always think of is, one of my teachers was like a tube, a straw is always stronger than a square any day. Mm -hmm. And so there's something really amazing about um, a cylinder when it comes to clay. <laughs> it really, mm -hmm. you know, I depend a lot on that cylinder. Um, I ask a lot of my clay and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm eternally grateful that, that it answers when I ask it does <laughs> ask it to for the most part you know um and your your hand building this is all hand built it's coil built um 
yeah, I make coils and then I stick them on the last layer, <laughs> keep going. Um, and I have, um, because you have to wait for it to dry enough to get the next layer on, mm -hmm. um, I have several going at the same time, you know. Um, if you look at my studio here, I have, you know, I had multiple things going at the same time so I could keep working so they would all dry and I could revisit them. Hopefully they don't dry too fast so I don't get to them in time. But it, it really is a dance, you know, in a relationship with that clay. Um, so why don't we um, bring Devin back in? And I know Devin has some questions that she'd um, like to ask. So Devin, why don't you come on back and let's uh, have some questions with Rose. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I looked at these yesterday with some of my classmates and, and friends and we had, like DJ said, such a great conversation. So one of the things um, that we're really wondering, um, and this is shifting a little bit away from your practice, but how can museum professionals and people who don't have connections to the indigenous experience better support artists and represent them within museum spaces? Um, to answer Devin's question, I feel like we've placed a lot of value on Western education and Western institutions. And I think that by changing our mindset around our value systems and what is considered art and what is considered valuable art, um, we can build the capacity to look in different places for ex artistic expressions um, and think about how those don't get ghettoized to certain uh, wings of an institution or certain shows, but seeing how we can incorporate them even into a conversation of you know, what constitutes art and value, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, it, it definitely does. I think that's so important within the museum space is to, you know, not use it as an other, but just incorporate it right off the bat. Like, like you said, not using different wings and things like that. Um, but I definitely also agree that education is is the best way to go all the time. Um, let's see, so some other things that we thought about just um, about looking, looking at the, the figures in Countdown was how do you interpret the human body as a tool of communication? Like, and how does the body communicate different messages? Um, I always think of, of figurative artwork as an avenue for empathic response. Um, that when we see a figure, we put ourselves in it. Um, and, you know, the more uh, sort of abstracted that figure is, the more inclusive it is. If it's very specific, then we see it as other. But if it's more abstracted, then it's more accessible. Um, and ideally, you know, we, we build an, uh, um, you know, a relationship with it and, and um, an empathic response. Yeah, we relate because we see ourselves in that situation. All of a sudden, we see a body doing something in space and we're like, oh, I know how that feels because I'm a human being. Um, so is, if something's anthropomorphized, um, and then not too specific. And I wonder too about, um, you know, gender and how I've struggled with, you know, gender isn't always explicit and yet um, they're self portraits. And so I'm always trying to navigate how much gender gets included and how that, you know, is ex it creates exclusivity or inclusivity according to how much gender gets included. Yeah, so I guess a good jump off question from that is, so when you're standing in front of them, they kind of look down at you, they're bigger than, I mean, taller than me, certainly, but is there any particular feeling that you wanted the viewer to kind of experience with them looking down like that? Um, well, first I was shooting for the main center glass. <laughs> So uh, initially, the size was was purely engineering. 
um, and structural. Uh, but I can see how, you know, for me, moving those around by myself was intimidating. And so, you know, for lack of a better way, it was a big deal, <laughs> you know? And the feeling of having something so big and clay leaning against glass, all these fat, uh, fragile materials and being on the outside of this glass, I really want to feel it. I, I, I think I need to go to Savannah and stand there or else I'm not going to fully understand it. Because in, in my studios, they always leaned against the wall. So I never got to stand in front of them like that, like you got to. I'm jealous. <laughs> And another thing we were wondering, just looking at them, is, is why don't that they have arms? We spent a lot of time looking at their legs and the different widths of their individual legs, but they don't, they don't have arms. A lot of my work don't have arms. Um, and I've been, you know, I'm, I'm caught by what people read in that. And, and so I think I learn a lot more about it from other people's reactions. Um, and a lot of it is about um, a relationship to powerlessness or the lack of agency or the ability to make change for yourself. Um, and those pieces specifically, there's three points of contact and those are two points, pointed feet and a forehead, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> and if it falls, it can't catch itself with arms. and. So they're intentionally and in a way removed to, um, I think, exacerbate the fragility of clay, you know? Um, yeah. Because they're, I mean, also clay is fragile. And so when I'm asking clay to be so big, um, you know, we, we think about, you know, its lifespan. <laughs> or you know you know its relationship to its own uh um, perpetuating its own existence or lack thereof if that makes sense awesome yeah i i really like like i don't know it's just really interesting looking at the the way that you created the the body in which different parts you you paid attention to so it's really interesting to hear um, another thing we looked at was the colors on the necklace and then the pendant that was made uh, that was on the end of the necklace and what that represented or and what the pendant was actually made out of. Um, the, the necklace and the pendants all clay and the, um, the beads that um, when I work in clay, I if there's any ever any um, extra clay, I turn it into beads. So I have like tons and tons of beads all over my studio. Um, and those, because they're high fire, they're really durable. Um, and I can use them as objects of adornment. Um, and, and I try really hard to keep them intuitive. I try to release pattern because um, it's such a really innate need for me to create a pattern out of the colors of the of the beads. Um, and so for this project, I enlisted my four-year-old daughter to bead for me um, because it's so hard for me to be like, no, you can't have two of the same color next to each other. And you have to have like one and then the other one and then the other one and then the other, if you're gonna do it. And I like trying to release that need to control it is, um, a practice for myself. And so I think the beads have a lot to do with them. Uh, a moment of allowing um, something to be what they need to be. And all the beads are, diff are the different clays that I use in my studio practice very constantly, consistently. Um, and then the pendants themselves were intended to be, um, they're like seed-like forms. Um, the idea was they were, they were like seeds um, and that they, uh, were made with local clays that I dug and then fired in a pit. So um, part of the part of the practice was to go um, and research and find um, avenues of ceramics and clay that were sort of in this area without co-opting local traditional sources of clay. 
So instead of going to, you know, where everyone digs their clay and, and taking that clay, I could go find my own and build a relationship with it. So that actually created a whole other side avenue of experience. And part of it is um, innovation, history, um, and also um, creativity and creativity beyond art, but also, um, you know, the seed we carry um, to the future, for future, for future generations um, that they're all sort of responsible for. Um, and I didn't, I was intending them to be these seeds that hung and uh, the placement of those seeds was um, on the figures themselves. They created a new layer of meaning. Awesome. So that was cool to see. All right, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I like. I really liked those. I was looking at the, the beads. That's really sweet that your four-year-old did that. She beaded them. Yeah. So cute. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I need you. All your. She has this release and a, allowance. Uh, in her creativity that I'm, I'm envious of. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so the, the jewel boxes, since they're along the sidewalk, um, uh, so the fact that people would be like walking by them and, and experiencing them that way, um, did that impact how you created the pieces? Um, other than that relationship with glass, and the external and internal and access and inaccessible and the breaking of boundaries and stereotypes and judgments and the check boxes that we, you know, we do. Um, there's something incredibly um, accessible about glass and inaccessible about not being able to get in there. And, and there, I mean, what a cool opportunity to, to build work in those spaces. Um, and um, I really wanted to experience it myself so I you know I'm excited to hear you know if anyone has any like really cool experiences of walking out there you know share them with me I want to hear about it because I feel really like distant yeah definitely I mean yeah I hope you can come see them maybe not I don't know but they're really powerful the the way that they're displayed but um rose i wanted to thank you so much for spending time with us we're um yeah and thank you to everybody here for joining us this concludes the final panel for define art 2021 so please visit scadmoa to see all of the incredible exhibits including rose's new installation countdown and don't forget to follow at Scadmo on Instagram. Have a day, have a great day, everybody, and thank you again so much. Thank you.